engines up and burning. Two, one, zero, and lift off. The final lift off. Of February 1st, 2003. The morning air at Kennedy Space Center is cool, clear, and bright. On the launch pad, Space Shuttle Columbia towers above the crowd, white against the sky. Steam hissing from its external tank, a symbol of technology, ambition, and trust. Seven astronauts walk across the gangway, their families watch from the viewing stands. The world tunes in. For many, shuttle launches have become routine, but for these seven, it is anything but ordinary. Commander Rick Husband, a man of deep faith, a father of two. He dreamed of flying, even as a child in Amarillo, Texas. Pilot William McCool, a former Navy test pilot. Calm, steady, with a reputation for discipline. Payload Commander Michael Anderson, the son of a bus driver from Spokane, Washington, known for his humility and quiet strength. Elon Ramon, Israel's first astronaut, a national hero, carrying a small Torah scroll from the Holocaust into space, Kalpana Chawla, born in Karnal, India, the first woman of Indian descent to fly in space. Her journey inspired millions back home. Laurel Clark and David Brown, both physicians, both chosen for their ability to bring science into the void of space. Together, they represented the best of NASA's spirit, diverse, determined, hopeful. The countdown begins. Three, Two, one, we have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Columbia leaps from the pad on a column of fire. The ground shakes, the crowd cheers. Inside the shuttle, the astronauts feel the force pressing them into their seats. It seems flawless, but at 81 seconds into flight, something happens. A piece of foam insulation about the size of a briefcase tears loose from the external tank. It drifts for less than a second, then slams into Columbia's left wing. On the live feed, it is almost invisible, just a flicker. To the astronauts, it is unfelt. No alarms, no warnings, just the roar of engines, carrying them higher. But that impact left behind more than debris. It left a hole, a hidden wound in Columbia's protective shield. NASA had seen foam strikes before. They were considered minor, Nothing to worry about, managers often said. But this strike was different. It would decide Columbia's fate, not that day, not in orbit, but when the shuttle tried to come home. What seemed like a flawless launch had already sealed the crew's destiny. The tragedy of Columbia had begun before anyone realized it. What happens when danger looks small, but grows unstoppable? While Columbia orbited Earth, Engineers on the ground replayed the launch footage. Something didn't look right. At T plus 81 seconds, a large piece of foam was seen breaking off the external tank. It struck the left wing of Columbia. The impact was undeniable. Inside mission control, voices began to whisper, was this a threat or just another case of foam shedding? Foam loss wasn't new. It had happened on previous flights. Managers had begun to treat it as normal as if a dangerous anomaly had somehow become acceptable. But some engineers weren't convinced. This strike looked bigger, heavier, more destructive. They worried the foam had damaged the reinforced carbon-carbon panels that shielded Columbia's wing from the heat of re-entry. If those panels were breached, plasma could rip the shuttle apart. One engineer sent an urgent request. Could the military point high-resolution spy satellites at Columbia? Could they capture images of the wing to confirm if damage existed? But the request stalled. Managers said it wasn't necessary. Foam strikes, they argued, had never caused a disaster before. And besides, what could be done if the damage was real? In meetings, risk assessments were written. They described the foam strike as a maintenance issue not a safety threat. The more cautious voices were drowned out. Warnings were labeled as overreacting. NASA's culture, shaped by years of success, leaned toward optimism. Meanwhile, the crew remained unaware. They performed experiments. They spoke cheerfully with family during downlink sessions. They filmed beautiful views of Earth. To them, nothing seemed wrong. They trusted NASA to alert them if danger existed but Mission Control chose silence. Why? Because managers feared telling the astronauts would only create panic. 
There was no repair kit on board, no second shuttle ready for rescue. So, they decided, better to let the crew continue their mission in peace, better to keep the truth hidden, but silence can be deadly. Every orbit, Columbia circled Earth, carrying a hidden wound. Every hour that passed, the chances of survival slipped further away. The shuttle still had to return home, and when it faced the furnace of re-entry, the truth would come roaring through that wing. What happens when the very people trained to spot danger decide not to look at it at all? High above Earth, Columbia's seven astronauts lived their dream. For 16 days, orbit seemed perfect. Commander Rick Husband guided the mission with steady hands. Pilot William McCool kept the shuttle on course, methodical and precise. Kalpana Chawla, who had once gazed at the night sky as a little girl in India, now floated effortlessly among the stars. Michael Anderson managed dozens of science experiments, filling racks with data that would return to Earth. Laurel Clark and David Brown, both physicians, marveled at how space affected the human body. And Ilan Ramon carried the pride of Israel with him, speaking to classrooms of children who saw him as a symbol of hope. Inside the cabin, laughter echoed. They filmed home videos, they shared meals, they left messages for their families. For the crew, the mission was smooth. No alarms, no visible danger, no reason to fear. But on the ground, engineers were unsettled. The foam strike weighed on their minds. Some whispered, what if the wing is compromised? Others insisted, it's fine, the shuttle will hold. Those who wanted action pushed for images. Military satellites could have revealed the truth. But NASA managers shut down the idea. They argued that even if a hole existed, nothing could be done to fix it. So a decision was made, one that remains controversial to this day. The crew would not be told. NASA kept the possibility of damage hidden. Leaders believed silence would spare the astronauts unnecessary fear. Why worry them if there was no solution? But was that true? If the damage had been confirmed early, another shuttle, Atlantis, might have been readied for a rescue. Risky, yes, but not impossible. Instead, Columbia's crew floated through orbit with unshakable trust. They believed mission control would protect them. They believed their spaceship was sound. Every smile they gave, every experiment they performed, carried a haunting truth. They were living their last days. On February 1st, Columbia turned for home, but the shuttle that carried them to the stars was already fatally wounded. What happens when silence is mistaken for mercy, yet becomes the very reason seven lives are lost? February 1st, 2003, 16 days after launch, Columbia begins its journey home. The crew straps in, seats locked, harnesses tightened. They smile for the onboard camera, ready to feel gravity again. Flight, we're go for re-entry. The command is given. The shuttle tilts, nose forward, wings angled. It plunges into the upper atmosphere at 17,000 miles per hour. At first, everything seems normal. Plasma streaks across the windows in orange fire. Re-entry always looks like this. Heat shields glow, protecting the ship from temperatures above 3,000 degrees. But this time, Columbia carries a wound the hole in the left wing, invisible to the crew, ignored by management. As the shuttle descends, superheated gas forces its way inside the wing. The structure begins to weaken. Sensors start to fail. Mission control notices first. Strange readings flash across their screens. Left wheel tire pressure sensors, gone. Hydraulic lines, unresponsive. Controllers exchange nervous glances. We're seeing some odd data. Still, they reassure themselves. Maybe it's just a sensor error. But the warnings multiply. Flight director Linda Hamm watches the data scroll in. Columbia is in trouble. On board, alarms begin to sound. Rick Husband and William McCool fight to steady the shuttle. The craft starts to roll unexpectedly, yawing left, then right. The autopilot struggles against forces it cannot control. Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages. Silence follows. Then husband's final words. Roger, uh, but... The transmission cuts off. Outside, Columbia is breaking apart. The left wing disintegrates first, ripped away by heat and stress. The fuselage twists violently. 
alarms blare, then vanish. At 200,000 feet, Columbia bursts into a fireball. Debris streaks across the Texas sky. Seven astronauts lose their lives in less than a minute. On the ground, families watch in horror as pieces of the shuttle rain down. The unthinkable has happened. The shuttle that launched with hope ended in fragments. The mission that carried dreams ended in silence. But the foam strike was not the only cause. The deeper truth lay inside NASA itself, in a culture that allowed danger to become invisible. What doomed Columbia more, the piece of falling foam, or the failure to listen when voices cried out in warning. In the days after Columbia disintegrated over Texas, grief swept across the world, but grief was quickly joined by questions. Why did it happen? Why did seven astronauts die when warning signs had been there all along? The investigation revealed the immediate cause. Foam insulation, torn from the external tank, had struck the shuttle's wing. It left a hole the size of a dinner plate in the reinforced carbon-carbon panel. On re-entry, plasma entered the gap and destroyed Columbia from within. But investigators didn't stop there, because the real story wasn't just about foam. It was about people, decisions, and a culture that allowed danger to hide in plain sight. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board uncovered something chilling. For years, foam shedding had been treated as normal. Every time foam fell from the tank without causing disaster, it became less alarming. Managers began to accept it as part of the shuttle's design. Warnings were dismissed, concerns were minimized, engineers who raised alarms were often ignored or silenced. During Columbia's mission, when requests for satellite images were made, management declined. They argued that even if damage was visible, the crew had no options for repair, but by refusing to look, they made a deadly assumption. They confused not knowing with being safe. The investigation's final report was damning. It stated, the causes of the accident were rooted in the space shuttle program's history and the cultural traits and organizational practices that prevented effective communication. In other words, Columbia was not only destroyed by foam, it was destroyed by NASA's culture, by normalization of risk, by leaders who feared delay more than they feared disaster. It was an error behind the error, the kind of error that cannot be fixed by replacing a part, the kind of error that lives in the system itself. But here lies the haunting question. If NASA had listened, if they had acted, could Columbia's crew have been saved? Was there still a chance to rescue seven lives? If only the truth had been faced in time. After Columbia's fiery breakup, the nation mourned. Flags were lowered. Memorials rose. Seven names were etched into history. Rick Husband, William McCool, Michael Anderson, Elan Ramon, Kalpana Chawla, Laurel Clark, David Brown. They were not just astronauts. They were fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters and their loss demanded answers. The investigation asked the hardest question of all. Could they have been saved? Some analysts believe yes. If NASA had acted in the first days of the mission, if they had requested military satellite photos, if they had admitted the foam strike was catastrophic, then perhaps Atlantis, the next shuttle, could have been rushed for a rescue. It would have been desperate, risky, but not impossible. Others argue no, that the timeline was too short, that resources were not in place, that rescue was a fantasy. But one truth is undeniable. By refusing even to look, NASA removed the possibility. The crew was never given a chance. From this tragedy, reforms followed. The shuttle fleet was grounded for more than two years. Foam shedding was finally treated as unacceptable. Communication practices were overhauled. NASA pledged never again to silence dissent. And yet, the shuttle program never escaped its shadow. Just eight years later, in 2011, the fleet was retired for good. The dream of routine shuttle flights, of turning space travel into something ordinary, was gone. But Columbia's crew left more than sorrow. They left a legacy. Kalpana Chawla inspired a generation of Indian children to believe that the stars were within reach. Ilan Ramon became a symbol of hope for Israel, his memory honored in classrooms and universities. Rick Husband, William McCool, Michael Anderson, Laurel Clark, and David Brown remain remembered not just as astronauts, 
but as pioneers who gave everything in pursuit of discovery. Their courage endures, their story endures, and their loss stands as a warning. The Columbia disaster was not fate. It was not the inevitable cost of space exploration. It was the result of human error, an error that doomed seven lives. The lesson of Columbia is simple. Space will never forgive complacency and silence when danger lurks can be deadlier than fire. Seven lives were lost, but if we remember their story, if we honor their legacy, perhaps their sacrifice will ensure the next generation of explorers return safely home. If this story moved you, take a moment to honor their memory. Like this video, share it, and subscribe for more stories of space, its triumphs, its tragedies, and its lessons.